What's up, everybody? This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 164. Today, we have a great roundtable discussion for you. We've brought back two past guests, Master Hughes and Alexander, and Mr. Richard Osborne. And together, the three of us talk about martial arts competition, things that we're doing right, things that we're doing wrong, and really, it's just a wonderful conversation. Stick around through this very brief introduction, and we'll get right into the meat of it. If this is your first episode, welcome. Thanks for checking us out. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host on the show, as well as the founder at Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. You can find everything we make over at whistlekick.com. You can find the show notes for this show, as well as other episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Today's show notes feature some links, including a glossary that we've put together of the various martial arts ratings organizations that we talk about on today's show. So depending on where you are and what time you were a competitor, maybe you're a competitor now, maybe you're a competitor in the past, you might find that glossary kind of handy. We use some abbreviations that not everybody knows. So that's the place to go, the show notes. There is no outro for today's episode. It's rolled right into the episode, so we're getting this stuff out of the way now so we can just leave you with the good conversation. It's just about an hour long. Thanks for tuning in. And really, that's all I've got to say. So I'm going to step back and let me from the past take it. Mr. Osborne, Master Alexander, welcome back to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. No, oh, thanks for having me. Thank hey, it's great to have you guys back. So, listeners, as I probably told you in the intro that I haven't recorded yet, but you heard before you got to this part, that's kind of the fun part of radio, right? We're going to talk about tournaments, martial arts competitions, and really the subject is that loose. I have no idea where we're going to go. We've talked very briefly about what we want to say and just kind of some places that we might want to go with this, but... We're just going to wander. We're going to see where the conversation takes us. And for me, that's always the fun part. So I think a good place that we can start is to talk about where are we in terms of martial arts competitions today? And and let's narrow it up a little bit. Some people out there, we're probably going to use the term sport karate a little more often than than might seem appropriate, but we're not singling out styles. You know, if you go to a lot of competitions today, they are referred to as karate tournaments, but there are plenty of Tang Sudo and Taekwondo and even Kung Fu practitioners there. So please, nobody get offended. We're not trying to exclude anybody. Where are we in terms of martial arts competitions right now? Um, I think we're kind of at somewhat of a standstill as far as the martial arts is concerned. You're seeing a lot in, if you want to call it extreme martial arts. You see an explosion there. That's really starting to grow well. Um, obviously, UFC and mixed martial arts is going really well. But as far as our sport, martial arts or traditional martial arts, um, I haven't seen I haven't seen a whole lot of growth in that area in a while. Mr. Osborne, yeah, you want, I, yeah go ahead. I was going to throw it I, to you. I was just saying, I'd have to agree on that. I think we're at a stalemate right now. The one thing that I will add as a caveat to that is that I do believe in my heart of hearts, though, that we actually have more people competing now than we ever have. The issue lies with, when we're talking about different styles and like that, there are 50 world champions in the United States. There's um, an unprecedented amount of leagues and sanctioning bodies and circuits it's in in different so we're a sport that's divided people wouldn't know our actual numbers because we're so split up um so I, I, like you said we're at a kind of a standstill right now we've kind of stalled out as far as the sport goes i still believe that our numbers are still really strong it's just the thing is we're not together on anything yet and that's what oh. i think we're, we're kind of stalled out at yeah yeah we're, we're definitely seeing a lot of sanctioning organizations a lot of tournaments i remember Growing up as a kid, you know, there were a handful of tournaments that were within driving distance. And now, honestly, and, and I know this because of Whistlecake, because attending events is part of what we do, I could be at two a weekend every week of the year and not even Easy. get on yeah. a plane. Yep. You know, it might Easy. be some long drives, but, you know, it's not that I'm flying internationally to make that happen. There are a lot of competitions out there. 
the piece mm-hmm. that I've always found really interesting and maybe a parallel, kind of curious what you guys think. As martial artists, we don't tend to agree on a lot. I mean, we maybe agree on some core stuff, but there's always politics. There's always, I can do this better than you can. And that leads to different styles and different schools and all this splintering. Do you think it's a reflection of that that has led to so many competitions or is it something else? No, I think it's everybody, um, you know, they want to be the best of the best per se, but under their rules. Um, you know, you, you go to this tournament, you go to that tournament. There's very few that are exactly the same. Um, you know, here in New England with the Epon circuit, they all run very similar, but we're starting to see now a lot of two point kicks, one, one point punches. The next tournament you go to might be one point for everything. Um, some are calling out of bounds. Some are not calling out of bounds. Um, you know, so I, I think that's where that's where that you're seeing a lot of that separation is we like what you have, but our school or our styles or our organization, well, we do it a little bit different and it doesn't really fit what we do. We like the atmosphere. Um, we like the competition, but the the rules need to be adjusted a little bit for it to be fair for us. And then when you adjust the rules in their favor, then it's not in, you know, another organization's favor. So they just kind of split off and do their own thing. Um, and probably the easiest comparison would be like a, uh, you know, like a, a traditional Shotokan tournament compared to an NBL tournament. And, you know, you got points that are going for the kickers. Very, you know, very various uh, numbers of points per difficult kick to, you know, your reverse punch that sets the person back a step is one point. Right. Yeah, right. I, I totally agree. The The sport martial arts is the ultimate free market. Anybody can start a tournament. Anybody can form a league. And like you said, if you don't like these set of rules, well, I can just go start a whole new circuit and I can change the rules to however we want. And I and it just you you were talking about extreme martial arts, you know, earlier. But when we talk about point fighting, if you just say point fighters, well, how many groups or people do point fighting? And like you said, there's 20 variations on how to run point fighting, but it's still at the core basis of it, point fighting. But the point differential difference is here. What I call for points is different over here, but it's still point fighting. And thousands upon thousands of people do a version of point fighting. The problem is, is that there's 25, 30, 40 different versions of point fighting, and we don't ever have, we don't have the crossover uh, anymore. I, I watched the tape the other day of a Taekwondo team that fought the Budweiser team back in the 80s. That doesn't happen anymore. And and not to, to knock organizations or systems, but you're not going to have much crossover anymore. People are not going to come from a, a, a closed circuit and fight in the open circuit. And some of the closed organizations are so darn big, I understand why they don't need to, because they can do seminars with their own group. They can go to their own in-house tournaments and have big numbers, and they just do not see the need uh, to go out and outside of their system or their. And you know, I've got one organization in my head, and and probably most people can draw a conclusion, but I mean, you will not find them out on the open circuit. Very few sprinkled in here and there, but they got their own nationals, their own world championships, and why do they need to come over to our? open side or the open tournaments right yeah exactly and, and I'm sure it's the same exact uh you know, organization as it's so large here in our in our country um here in new england once in a while they'll come in and they'll try and dabble in a circuit here but um i did see something that w- it's uh and i don't know if it's out west as well haven't seen much of it but one of the tournaments here um it's on the crane circuit um they're calling it speed fighting which I think yes. is, which is I think is a great idea, because um, they are much more of a speed style fighting rather than a point style technique fighting. You know that stiff arm back fist, stiff arm reverse punch with no retraction. You know most tournaments you're not going to get that as a point because you didn't do a technique, you did half a technique. But in speed fighting, it is a point. Right now, both yeah, of you said. Point. 
pretty early on that you agree that we've stagnated as a, as a sport. And, you know, and, and I think that we're both, we're all going to talk a lot about the, the sparring, the fighting aspect of competitions, but you know, I, I think most of what we're going to say is going to relate just as well to forms and everything else. Cause you know, if you're talking about judging someone's form, there are 25 different ways that you can evaluate that. What I want to do now is, is kind of look back a little bit. If we've stagnated, that implies that maybe we were doing a better job. We were at least having some progress in the past. How have martial arts competitions changed over, let's say, the last 15, 20 years? 15 to 20? Um, i definitely say your gymnastics element has come in. You're, you're extreme. Uh, a lot more people are doing creative um, I mean, I remember, and I'm sure you remember back in, you know, the late 80s, early 90s, um, in my form, in my competition form, I had a creative form competing against everyone else who did traditional. Um, yeah. And it was it was a traditional base, but, you know, I had a kick, which now they call, you know, a 720 kick. Um, and I had that in my, you know, in my form. And it, just, it would blow people away that something like that could be done or had been done in a competition with balance and structure and stance. Um, and now, you, I mean, the evolution of things have, have really come, come around as far as technique-wise for the, uh, the flash martial art. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I think our point fighting has evolved our forms have evolved but you know and, and like i said i can't put a, a a pinpoint on it but you know just going back to the late 80s and mid 80s you know uh and we've talked i know we talked a little bit off air too but you know we had a national presence on national tv uh i had heard one time that nasty anderson was making a hundred thousand dollars a year off of sport karate i mean that is uh, you know, I don't know with seminars, and there may be some other martial artists out there doing that now, but, you know, that's unheard of now. Or the prize money has went down a little bit. Uh, we're a sport that's kind of splintered off. You know, we've only got basically one tournament now that has any kind of really national presence, and they get 30 minutes a year on ESPN2 or 45 right. minutes or whatever it is for that yeah. show. And so, um, to me, as far as the time period, Something happened in the early to mid '90s that we went either a different direction, whether it was the UFC or something has splintered off to where we didn't progress. And like I said, now I don't know what the actual cause of it was, but I know I would have to center it around the '90s. We started to make a, an evolution towards um, not being. We didn't capitalize on what we did in the '80s. We had national coverage. We had the Budweiser team. We had uh, the Trans World. Uh, oil team, you know, we had major companies picking up teams, you know, Billy Blanks wanted to go into Tybo. And I mean, we had, we had some big names, big faces and somewhere, somehow we stalled out. And, uh, and I just, I still, to this day, I can't put a finger on exactly where we went the other direction. I think it's a lot of the separation, a lot of the separation, you know, back then there was, um, less people trying to be number one, so to speak. As far as we you had one, you know, the, the WKA, ISKA, um, PKL, you know, those were your bigger sanctioning bodies. There wasn't 700 smaller sanctioning bodies that people are getting into. Um, you know, like right now you have NBL, ISKA, Crane, NASCA, as far as international and, and national competition but there's still people that say that you know they're a 35 time national champion and they've only fought in two states right 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 and i think a lot of it comes down to money you know we talk about what has changed and why i think anytime you you look at anything you can find the why in money so yes if we look at what was going on back then back in the 60s 70s 80s Longtime listeners to the show know that we've had quite a few people on who remember that so-called blood and guts era of martial arts competition when a, a tournament could attract a thousand, two thousand competitors. I don't want to say easily, but w without a lot of question, because there weren't quite so many competitions. But when you're talking about 
excuse me, collecting 40, 50, 60, a hundred dollars per person to come in the door it or more or more. It doesn't take a lot of people for that money to become really lucrative. All three mm-hmm. of us have run a competition. We know what the back end economics look like. And a lot of people out there see the opportunity. So I think it's created a lot of dilution and that prize money starts to dry up because if I've got a competition, if I'm, let's say after everything's said and done and, you know, I, I'm going to be able to put $5,000 in my pocket. Well, if I give a thousand dollars out in prize money, am I going to have at least a thousand dollars in additional competitors? And most of the time, the answer is no. Mm-hmm. And you'll see opportunities. Master Alexander, you and I have talked about this a number of times, actually. The idea that if you build the economics of a competition around prize money, it doesn't always attract a positive element. Not and, very often. And we had an example of that at a local event, you know, just recently. Um, some people came that weren't quite spun up on the rules and, and the group that typically attend this particular event. And it led to some things, some problems. Yep. So Yeah, and it can it and it can hurt our I'm not saying hurt, but it, it affects our regional guys. When we start doing money um, with prize money too, we do attract a higher quality of fighters sometimes um, with the other end of the spectrum. And then it, 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 I don't want to use the word scare. I'm not saying that somebody is fearful of competing, but if they don't feel like they're up to the level of the competition that's going to show up for the money, and then our local and regional fighters that are trying to be the up and comers won't show up because of the, um, the people, the names that are going to be there. You know, even if I was a fighter, you know, and some of us are just competitors and we want, if Raymond Daniels is going to be at a tournament, I want to be there just because I want to be able to fight the guy. I don't care if I win or lose. I want that shot, but not everybody Absolutely. feels that way. They're yep. like, Hey, I, I'm not going to win that tournament. So why do I even go and spend my money to even go and compete? So the professional element, and I, I consider Ross and Rain and all those guys, professional athletes, but we never developed a pro league. I don't think we could be, and I've, I've, I've posed this question a hundred times on Facebook, and I've never been able to talk to the big guys, but could we turn a UFC type of promotional company for sport karate? I'm not saying we could be UFC. I don't think we could be that kind of company, but we could do a pro circuit for pro athletes, and I think people would show up. A prime example of a huge nighttime finals Kind of what you guys are talking about, the Quebec Open that's going to be, I think, coming up in the next month or so. They get like three, 4,000 people to come watch sport karate at night. I mean, and, and they're serving out. I mean, it's like, it's like a concert. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. And I think that can be duplicated throughout the United States. But we need to develop a pro league for these guys, Raymond, Ross. And we need to be able to see if we can get them a way to be pro athletes. I consider those guys pro athletes. Um, they, they train like pro athletes. They train just as hard as an NFL, NBA, NBA guy. And we don't have a pro league for those guys. And it needs to be a pro and an amateur type of deal to where you work your way up through the ranks. And when you get there, you get rewarded. And, and again, I'm, 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 I'm kind of getting off a little bit off, but you guys see where my point is on that. Yeah. 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 And, and well, like I said before, years ago, there was the AKL and the PKL. That was probably one of the strongest circuits that like you're talking about um, the AKL PKL and then the NBL. Those were your, your three large bodies back then. Um, and Norris tried to do that. Chuck Norris tried to do that with the world combat league, but he tried to add, you know, the, the mix of the full contact seeing that UFC was such a large draw, but he was trying to blend in the two. Um, you know, I was right on the edge of being on the new England team before it closed, but it started off with a bang because Norris was behind it, but it came, it came down to rule sets. Um, you know, you had some of these top boxers, these top kickboxers, Muay Thai style fighters, um, San Shao style fighters. Then you had your point fighters and then you had your, let's call them speed fighting fighters. You know, and that was the, closest you could get to bringing them all into one ring but then there was always the well but it was more his style of fighting than it really was mine 
you know, the big, yeah. the big, uh, the big explosion to the WCL was the lead up to the Stephen Wonderboy Thompson and Raymond Daniels fight. Everybody was just, just drooling for that fight to happen. And, you know, Thompson had an injury and it ended up as a, you know, no contest style fight. Um, so you're looking at Raymond Daniels, one of the best multi-style fighters ever. And Steven Thompson, who's now proved himself in the MMA world. But before that is an um, amateur that was unreal in the, in the amateur ring to bring it into the pro kickboxing, uh, American style rules, like our point fighting, uh, everything above the waist. Um, you know, he, those two were just going to be the, you know, the, the biggest fight ever. And, you know, Chuck Norris couldn't keep it supported. So I would love to see, I I agree with you. I would love to see something like that happen again, but if Chuck Norris couldn't pull it off, I mean, Chuck can do anything, you know? Right. And and that certainly (laughs) exposes how big of a challenge this is. I don't think anybody argues that a well-presented, well-officiated point fight or even forms competition, especially with the inclusion of the more dramatic movements, the more extreme movements, the the more dramatic things become, the more appealing they are to people outside of the sport. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I will sit down and I will watch the most traditional Japanese kata and I can be engrossed, but I know that my non-martial arts friends aren't really going to dig that. Mm-hmm. But I can show them some old footage of, of Mike Chat or some new footage of anybody else that's you know doing these dramatic i mean double bow routines i mean just crazy creative stuff and they're going to watch it and they're going to be at least interested maybe not for as long as i am but they're going to they're going to see the value the entertainment value in that so i don't Mm -hmm. think we have to question whether or not it could work it comes down to i think the economics who's going to put up the i'm going to guess five to ten million dollars to get something like that off the ground well, at least, yeah, I would have to agree. It's big numbers like that. Yeah, and then you got, and then like he said, you got your competitors that are doing their own thing. And and again, I'm not downplaying. I I applaud them for doing that. But if I'm a world champ in my league or sanction of body, and I'm gonna the rest of my life, I can do seminars, I can make money, I can run a successful school, and I never have to walk outside of this league or organization and the rest of my life i can do seminars with these people i can sell them product and i can be the i can be the golden person i don't want to say golden boy because it includes women too because we got to talk about our women in the sport too because that's kind of down too but i can be the golden child or person of this league and i never got to step outside i don't have to go and face raymond i don't have to go and face ross Uh, you know maybe in the back of my head i want to see what i can compare to those people or, you know, or Chelsea Nash or somebody like that, you know, I don't have to go out, Morgan Plowden, I don't have to go out and face those people because I can be the best in mine, never have to come outside of it. And that's, I guess that's the other part of it too, is that how are we going to pull everybody together? You know, that, that's my big thing with, in my region right now, I have taken a grassroots rep, you know, I'm going out to these closed circuits and going, Hey, crossover. I promise you, it's not, you guys are talented. I know that you can do this, and I know you can win in this. This, But the crossover has got to happen, and we've got to be able to pull people together. I think that's the other element, too, like we kind of alluded on. We're just so divided. Man, they're just so they're so far out every place, and we've got to find a way to get everybody minted in. I mean, right now our biggest sanctioning body is probably volume of competitors-wise is probably NASCA. I but, agree. Totally. You know, yeah. most, most, pe- most, most people aren't going to know. Um, and we've talked, we talk a little bit about like competitors' names and stuff like that. But most martial arts schools, when they buy, and I won't mention companies, but if you buy a Jackson Rudolph signature bow, does most people even know what league that Jackson Rudolph even competes in? Right. Do they even know what league? How do I find out what tournaments Jackson Ru- Rudolph is competing at? I've got well, one YouTube. Of bows. <laughs> yeah, that's it. YouTube. That's, right. and that's, so, you know, and I've always, and, and I'm not, just a NASCA at all because I want, you know, I would like to be a NASCA event one day and, and do a world event. But, you know, I, I think we need a league to step up and go, you know what? This is the NBA of sport martial arts. This is where the top competitors are. We've got Jackson Rudolph. We've got the Presleys. We've got Raymond Daniels. We've got Ross Levine. I think the promotion of fighters or competitors, we've got, uh, who's the gentleman that made the Olympic team down of Florida Torres? Um, I believe his last name. 
Um, you know, he's, I think he won second at the Olympic trials. And, and uh, But anyways, we need those guys being put up and saying, here's our – this is our guys. These guys are competing in this league. So if you want to be the top, this is the league you need to come to. And I don't think a league has ever established himself like that to go, you know what, we're the NBA of sport martial arts. This is where the big-time players come. So if you want to be a big-time player, come this way. That's kind of a long mm-hmm. answer, so I didn't mean to ramble on there. It's not rambling, and I, I think that you're right. It takes somebody being able to say, we are the top. But what determines that? The reason that the NBA was able to compete against the ABA, and if I remember correctly, the, uh, there, was, there was even a Canadian basketball association, was money. They ended up with the money that gave them the power, and they were able to absorb those other leagues and those other players. Yeah. Is there motivation on the part of NASCAR or any other circuit to come up with so much money that they absorb the other leagues? I don't know well, here's what where is. I think. Here's where I think that would – what would have to happen is you'd have to take – you know, we've been throwing NASCAR around because, you know, they're the biggest – the ISKA and NASCA, I think, are the biggest, um, if you're going to look at worldwide style uh, martial arts. They would have to pull some of these, let's call them mid-level bodies together and say, here's what we're looking for from you, and we will help build you along our way, you know, as far as like a financial commitment. You are with you are with us for this whole road as long as the road keeps going, and we will build you. Because if you look, I mean, that's what like D League basketball. They are they are the you know the the, the low end of the NBA. You got your Triple A, Double A, Single A ball. I mean, that's what are you trying to do when you're in Single A ball? Make it to Triple, Triple to the big leagues. You know, I mean, that's that's where you're trying to grow. Um, and I think if if somebody could pull that together, it would be a NASCA or an ISKA um, and say, all right, who's the biggest sanctioning body in New England? Who's the biggest sanctioning body in, in the West? There might be two or three of them out West and down South and, you know, the central United States. OK, we're going to talk to the biggest person because they have the most connections in their area and say, would you be interested? And, you know, if they were to have that meeting or you know round table discussion i think something could be put put in the in, into play you get the ball rolling on it but everybody under them would have to realize that they're going to take the you know they're going to take the big financial risk which they wouldn't need to do they couldn't go in it as a you know you give us 25% you give us 25% we'll throw in our 25% we're still going to be the a number 1 circuit that are, people are going to try and get to and we're going to get the most benefit out of it you know I, I think it would have to be a you know they take 40 percent of the financial burden and then you know 10 percent to six other sanctioning bodies and they, they might have something there is that oh, enough to unify rules well because that's what i mean you'd have to get everybody together as, right. a, as a round table right. and say all right Let's pick our brains. This is what we're going to do. Are you, you know, are you willing to modify your circuit a little bit? As you know, let's say that there's six other smaller sanctions for different regions. Are you, you know, are you willing to sanction with us and modify your rules? But everybody has to be trained on these rules. Everybody has to abide by these rules because when they make it to the big league, there's no left or right of the rules. Um, let's take a step back from the the type of competitions we're talking about right now. We we've all mentioned, or, or at least we've talked a little bit today about mixed martial arts and specifically the UFC. We know the UFC is the big dog. They're the, the 800 pound gorilla, so to speak of mixed martial arts. And there's still K one. There's still pride. You know, there's still these other organizations that are much smaller and they've sort of become the, the minor leagues in a sense. But what? they're different rules. But they're different rules. Yep. But they are. They are. The money is there, right? I mean, mm-hmm. we we know that there is motivation if you are, you know, if if you're a top level undefeated competitor in Pride, 
if you are invited to a fight in the UFC, you're going to take that opportunity because the money's oh, yeah. there. Yep. So what was it that the UFC did early on that made this work? Is it they blended all styles? But what but why why was it able to take take off? Was it because they were on TV? Was it because they were throwing people in a cage and nobody was really doing that in that way? You know, it's it's an octagon for a reason. It's a different shape than we're used to seeing. You know, was it gimmick or is there substance uh, there? Well, I you know a, a thing, you know, they had a pretty good following in the nineties, it was like it was okay. But once they modified their rules, I mean there's still blood and, and there's still stuff like that. But once they modified the rules and kind of made it look more like they did the weight classes, it looks like a professional sport. You've got weight classes. You've got a set amount of rules. Like in what? And, I, and just to go back just a little bit of what you were saying about the grassroots effort, I totally agree. It's a region by region type of deal. Somebody has to take over and go, okay, we're going to take over this whole country. In every region, we're going to have X, Y, and Z. With the UFC, going back to the UFC, they modified their rules. They had simple rules because in those first early 90s, you could hit each other in the groin. There was no pads. I it started mean, it NHB. Free... It, huh? It started as an NHB, no holds barred. I mean, you could do anything. That's exactly, yeah. And it was, there was blood. There was a 500-pound guy fighting a 200-pound guy. But once they, and I'm going to bring him back in boxing because I still think boxing has the most prize money, but. Boxing has not got the fan base anymore like what MMA has now. I think they're getting close to being equal. But once they started doing what boxing was doing, they had the weight classes. They they made the rules more precise on what you can and can't do. Um, they took out some illegal moves. Once they made it more of a rules-based type of competition, that's what I think when they exploded. Because I think people wanted to see that. People wanted to see the boxing. And now, today, fast forward to today... You know, I still think we may be a few years off, but I think it could help sport karate. Every time Wonder Boy throws a spin hip kick or side kicks somebody across the, the ring or Page, like uh, Venom Page from over in Europe that's been fighting on Bellator, every time yeah. those guys do something, that kind of piques people's interest going, man, what kind of fighting is that? What, is, what are those guys doing? And we see it every single day when we travel to a tournament. We're like, man, we see that all the time. I mean, there's there's a 100 guys that look like that. I mean, they're not that as talented as – as those guys are like, you know, Sage Northcutt. He was like, well, how are those guys moving like that? Well, we see that every day. So I think that there's maybe a little bit of a surge in viewership for us, but we have to capitalize on it. But I think it was the rules. Once they streamlined the rules, they made the weight classes, they made it look like boxing, but it was MMA. I think that's when they made the turn, and then they just marketed the crap out of it. And right. Their marketing is second to none. They have some of the best marketing. I think they're a little bit overdone on fights. I think they have too many fights. They can't develop stars anymore because everybody's getting beat. And they're fighting too often. So it can't be a, a Mayweather-Pacquiao fight because it's going to happen every three months. And so, again, I think it was the way that they changed it to make it look kind of like boxing, but MMA. Yeah, and I totally, back to that Sage Norcut thing, um, I was going to bring it up. Who, who's uh, who's Sage working with right now? Woodley. Woodley brought Sage in so that he can, one, get more of that movement style to go against Thompson for their second fight coming up. And yep. you know he's going to be getting footwork from him. Yep. You know, because he has a very, Woodley has a very boxing style, not heavy on his feet, but way heavier than a point fighter. Um, you know, so he's going to be, taking notes as to you know how Sage moves as well. And I think right now, as far as the fight world, and I know we've been talking a lot about fighting, um, I think now's the time to, to jump on this if somebody could step in and pull it together because you have Stephen Thompson, Sage Norcutt that are making a splash in mainstream UFC, and it's their traditional martial arts, to point fighting, to let's call it speed fighting, to full contact that has brought them in to being so successful in MMA. Absolutely. I totally agree. And like you said, I think we talk about fighting because fighting is like a big draw right now. But And like you said, for the extreme stuff, we still have a captive audience for traditional forms. What I mean by captive audience is that there's 
hundreds of thousands of people that do martial arts. So if we were to show traditional martial arts on TV, we would still have a viewership of martial artists watching it. But for a spectator, if we put an extreme person on there, a Reed Presley, a Jackson Rudolph, uh, you know, a, a Jacob Pinto, those guys doing all the flips, then we would bring in the other eyes. So I don't want to leave the forums guys out either. But, you know, traditional martial arts, we do have an audience, but the audience is going to be us martial artists watching another martial artist. The, the outside spectator viewership is going to be fighting, and it's going to be the extreme stuff. That's what's going to bring eyes to our sport. Um, you know, I compare us to the X Games. I always think we could have been at X Games. You know, X Games wind up getting, like, the energy drinks and stuff like that picking up. We could have been the next X Games type of deal to where lots of people were doing it, but there was no viewership. Then once they got on national TV, they started getting, you know, uh, a love and, you know, like fishing and bowling and, and stuff like that. We don't even have the money that the that bass fishing has. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable where we're not, we haven't developed that with our, with our athletes. Right. Now let's talk about the Olympics. We, we, I think everybody out there probably knows, at least if you've been listening to the show or follow martial arts news online, that karate is going to be included as a demonstration sport in Tokyo in 2020. There are a lot of people looking at that as perhaps an opportunity. Does that give those folks that are not WTF style Taekwondo a path? Do you think that carrot, so to speak, in a few years, do you think that could help right this ship or is this, or is it going in totally the wrong direction? I do. I think it definitely can help. Um, here's where I'm kind of torn with, with this idea is because if it hits Olympic level, what we're talking about right now will have to conform to their rule set. We'll have to because people are going to want to go into, you know, or, or if not exact rules, very, very close very, very close to what the Olympic rule set is going to be because people want to get to the NBA and have the option to not change much of their game to go to the Olympics. Um, yeah. yeah. So it, it, I, I like, I love the idea. Give, give us martial artists a chance um, at, you know, Olympic stardom. Um, but I think it's going to be much harder to do a let's say, a free base of rules for what we're talking about right now as far as one big sanctioning body that everyone's trying to get to the big, you know, the big game, the big leagues, so to speak. Um, if, the Olympics, if the Olympics step in first, we're going to have to follow suit to what they do. Yeah, if that, Within reason. If that I mean, there's, there's still rules, rules that the Olympics have that are different than what we have for the NBA. Um, not that the United States has the only, you know, basketball stuff, but we'll we'll just have to conform more to their rule set than us making our own in Olympics having to follow us. Right, and that's a that's a great point. That's exactly what I was getting to when I've talked to people. You know, I'm a Taekwondo stylist. They're like, well, you know, the Olympic guys are the best Taekwondo fighters in the world. And I'm like, well, hold on, you haven't met X, Y, and Z fighter. Well, who is that? Well, they don't do Olympic fighting, so. Like you said, we kind of were now we're behind the eight ball because we could have developed, even though the NBA, we, we have the NBA, right, for basketball, but we'll send NBA players over to, to play in the Olympics. But the Olympic competition is still not the NBA. We never developed our pro league. So now the Olympics, to people's eyes, are the top echelon. And like you said, now we've got to play catch up because our style of point fighting you know, what's our upper, what's our upper echelon? We know that NASCA fighters are probably some of the best top point fighters, but how many NASCA fighters are going to convert over to WKF rules to fight with the Olympics? Probably very few, yeah. if any of them are, they're going to convert. And so now we've, we got to play catch up. Or like you said, we've got to convert or conform to what they're doing. Even though know, we may have a hundred thousand players in point fighting and they have a hundred thousand players in point in their WKF point fighting, but they have the Olympics. What do we've got? Well, we've got NASCAR, but you can't. What's okay? Is NASCAR going to be on national TV on ABC? No, it's not. So that is a great point. We've got to play catch up. We never developed our league to say, okay, we're going to send our top players to the Olympics, but this is still the top league. Whether it's NASCAR, NBL, 
We never had – we should have had a league to say, okay, but this is where the top players play, and that the Olympics is awesome. Let's go represent our country. But, you know, and I, I always thought that sport karate probably should. I think and at one point in time back in the 80s, early 90s, I thought we had a chance with our type of point fighting. I know with Waco and – Waco, Waco, sorry. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, I think they had a chance to kind of – they were trying to get in and take our style of, of that to the Olympics, but it never could. Again, we were so divided. We couldn't go as a group and go, hey, well, here's the rule set. Everybody's going to follow it. Well, no, we don't want to do that. And so it kind of lost our chance. But that's a that's a great point because I like our sport, and I like the way we do. And people are going to see the Olympics and go, man, that is the top point fighters in the nation. Well, it may not be the top point fighters in the nation. That's the top point fighters in that system or style. But you haven't seen sport karate tournaments, and we have some pretty good talented people, too, that maybe even be better than that, and it's more of a different pace of a fight. What I'm worried about is that people get on national TV. I don't know if you've seen the video of the two women that's been circling around YouTube, but the two women basically go into a draw. They never hit each other. Like, it yeah. ends up being a penalty. And people yeah. people, are, people are going, that's new point fighting? I'm like, whoa, 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 hold on. No, 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 no. No, that's no, not, no. That's, that's WKF point fighting. That's not... Let me show you Morgan Plowden real quick. Let me let me show you let me show you some of these girls that are fighting. This is this is what we call point fighting and women's point fighting. Oh wait, that that score is fifteen to twelve. You know that's that's a little bit more high scoring type of. That's what we're thinking point fighting is. And so right. uh, again, I apologize. I don't mean to keep going off on tangents. I get excited about this whole sports <laughs> stuff, but uh, tangents but you are good. See where I'm coming from. It's the heart of the show. Love the tangents. <laughs> you know, one of the things I think is is interesting when we talk about. Uh, the Olympics and the impact of the Olympics is I remember back 88, how everybody was so excited when Taekwondo was, was going to be a demonstration sport. And, you know, there, there's obviously, there's been a lot of politics behind Taekwondo being pulled out and then put back in and everything. But if you, if you just think about what happened in 2016 with Taekwondo, if you followed the way all of that went, almost no one was happy. They were all unhappy yeah. for different reasons, but very few of the people, I mean, and we're, we're talking former Olympic Taekwondo medalists that, you know, I'm at least, I don't want to say I'm friends with, but I follow some of what they say. Everybody pretty much across the sport was unhappy for one reason or another. And does that leave an opportunity, excuse me, with karate? I'm sure that, you know, it's it's going to be small. They're not going to get everything right. There are going to be a lot of us, maybe even most of us, sitting there screaming at the television saying, you know, why isn't it this? Why isn't it that? That could give us another four years. And or does it increase the overall exposure enough that finally the money starts to come in and we can get better organized? Hey, well, it, it, it could. I just don't, I feel like that is the, like, uh, like he was saying before, I think that's what everybody's going to want to conform to that. And I still don't think that that's the answer for, uh, you know, again, I don't want to take away from me from WKF because there's always a, we're better than you and we're better than you. And I don't want it to be that way. I want us all together. I've always tried to preach that, but I don't know if that's the direction still as a mainstream point fighting, it's going to help. I think it'll help, but we're, I'm called sport karate, but I'm a Taekwondo practitioner. So am I supposed to go to the Olympics? Well, I'm not a big fan of Olympic fighting. I don't want to do Olympic fighting. So now my only choice, if my kids want to do something, would be the WKF fighting. But I'm a Taekwondo guy. So the open martial arts tournament element, because, again, going back to open tournaments, we're not going to tell anybody, no, they can't come. We're just saying, here's the rules. I don't care what style you are. You're a Kempo, you're a Kung Fu, whatever. Here's what the rules are, but your style can come and compete with us. And I still think open tournaments are the ultimate platform. I think that's why the MMA, well, I'm a wrestler, jiu-jitsu guy. Well, I'm a freestyle fighter. Well, I'm a this and this. We can still have an MMA element of martial arts with what we do, but we can't get everybody on the same page. So I don't know if it's going to help us. I, I think it'll help get exposure. But a guy that watches WKF uh, fighting – would be like, well, that's not how Wonder Boy, like he, like he was talking about. That's not how, man, Northcutt doesn't look like that. He doesn't, and then we're at the TV screen, we're like, no, that's not the same. We're, we're, it's different. <laughs> you know, right. there's, there's a different element to this. But again, yeah. we're, we're, 
we're a country divided. Yeah. <laughs> like everything else. Yeah. Master Alexander. Well, I think, go ahead. Uh, I think what when it comes to tournaments, the fighting end, which we keep going back to, is, is a struggle. I think it's the fighting end that upholds the biggest problem. Because yeah, if I look, totally agree. look at you know, look at look look at NASCAR, look at ISKA. Um, they you have your Korean forms, you have your Japanese forms, you have your creative forms. So no more than a three hundred and sixty degree revolution without your you know foot coming to the floor. Then you have your extreme. So in weapons, you have four divisions. In forms, kata, you have at least four divisions again. Fighting, you got one, and you got to try and figure out. You got to figure out what your rules are going to be, so everybody can play by those rules. Or you're really opening, or you really open up the sanctioning body to multi-rule styles, which is more the ISK level. That's more what ISK does rather than NASCA. And you're talking, you know, point fighting. Speed fighting, continuous contact point fighting, semi-contact continuous, full contact continuous, you know, in order to level out the, the playing field of that one sanctioning body, which I think could be done. I really think it could be done. It would give you um, it would give you a lot more corporate businesses to work with and try and help you along with that with those sponsorships because they'd want in on it. Um, you know, let, let's take for granted like um take into consideration Hayabusa. Hayabusa right now is, is making a, a really good name for themselves, not in full contact. Right. In sport martial arts. Where did they come from? Well, they saw an opportunity and they got some of the, some of the top people, males and females, to come on board with them from their smaller teams or to step out of a bigger team and be with them, promise them, some financial compensation, some great gear, travel expenses, and now all of a sudden you're seeing Hayabusa in, you know, in in the runoffs at all of these big events, whether they're local or, you know, a larger, you know, world level event. You're seeing Hayabusa out there, and, and you know they're starting to make that that step over, and I think you would be able to do that if if you were able to pull everybody's brain around having more divisions for fighting. Yeah. We have them and for forms and weapons. And a lot of these companies, and, and again, we don't want to mention names of companies, but you know, a lot of companies, I think for years, they kind of underestimated the sport martial arts market and how large and how big it is. Hayabusa, like you said, was kind of, and I think, I think some other companies are catching on now and they're just kind of playing catch up, but you know, a couple other companies that were foreign companies or companies that were uh, competitor-driven basically came in and swooped up some of the sport and martial arts business. And I think we're going to see starting to see some of our major companies, and we all know who those companies are. We don't have to say names, but I think some of those companies are going to start coming back into the sport and martial arts world. And you know, there may be some opportunities down there down the road. But you're absolutely right, Hayabusa. You know, it's it, it, jumping in on the sport karate scene. I see their uniforms and their gear all over the place now and just a year ago you didn't see hardly any well maybe two years ago you didn't see hardly any of their stuff so yeah i i I agree eyes and merchandise and how we can help a product grow um you know and and going back to rules on martial arts on our on our fighting side i know we keep going back to that but you know making it simple too um simpler rules i think simple is better it's if we've got judges that are going to make human errors on on competitions then the rules need to be simple uh, mm-hmm. you know, I, I was, I, I'd love the NBL concept as far as how they set up the league. When Boyce first started the league, I thought his concept was great. He started with regionals. He had, would like have a big tournament in that region. I mean, I thought the concept was great, but I never could adjust to like, uh, a spinning kick was three and this was two. And, and I like the scoring going up, but, uh, you know, the multiple Very points, stuff like that. Uh, what's that? Just very complicated. You have to have a very educated, very skilled black belt judge in order to judge that. You can't just pull somebody out of the bleachers that has right. been in the dojo and earned a black belt. Right. Exactly. And exactly. That's the other point that the professionalism is that 
we have to go and, and it's hard to get judges sometimes. You have to recruit as a promoter and me and you and, and you you guys all know we've got it hard we gotta go just as hard to get competitors to come to a event. We've got to do just as hard to get the right judges to come. We have to recruit judges the same way. And so making it simpler, and this is simple. If this lands, this is a point. If you can't see it, you can't call it. That's Just right. Making things so simple to where everybody, like you said, I could take an 18 year old black belt that soaks up everything like a sponge and go, look, this is what you can do. This is what you can call. This is what you can't call. Keep it simple. And I bet you I could turn an 18 year old black belt into a better judge than some of the judging I've seen around the country because they're just going to listen to what we say and say, look, don't call this, call this. And that's it. That's the only calls you're going to make. Don't, don't right. think too much into it. If you can't see it, don't call it. Don't call on sound. If you hear it and you still can't see it, don't call it. Move around in the ring. You know, just real simple, basic yep. stuff. But that's going on a judging thing. We could probably go two hours on that. I'm sure we could. <laughs> we, we've spent a lot of time today kind of beating up on martial arts competitions. We've talked a lot about what could be improved and where we went wrong. I want to start to wind down, but I want to do it on more of a positive note because it's something that's really important to me. What is right about martial arts competitions right now? Family oriented for the most part. There are some, you know, there's some blood and gut cutthroat competitions out there. We know what those are, the competitors that come in um, to other events, uh, especially here in New England. Uh, you know, Jeremy, you've been to a lot of our, our events here in New England. Yeah. Um, for years and years, and I think now more than ever, you'll, you're seeing our New England events. Every competitor in a division, the parents are sitting in the stands hanging out with each other. Um, before the tournament, after the tournament, they're going out. You know, they have breakfast together. Their, their children are going to be fighting soon. But they're hanging out, and, and I think because... It, and we we call it a true martial arts family, our competition martial arts family, because it, that's what it's about. You know, we, you can have that, you know, flip that switch and I am going to beat you, but you are still my non-blood brother. I, I am going to beat you five to zero. And this was instilled in my head at, from, you know, when I was a young competitor all the way up through. Your teammates, but you know what you do? You go out there and you whoop them, and then you shake, you, you know, you shake hands and you hug after after the event, and we're going to ride home together. You can't be mad at each other, but you go down there and you beat them. So I think it's family. It's just we're we're keeping those those family um, family oriented atmosphere things. Um, those events I think are are the best. I agree. I agree. Mr. I agree. Osborne, what, what do you think is yeah. right? Well, let me and, and let me let me start with this. The three of us that are on this call right now, that we're talking to each other, we are not the only three that have the love for the sport across this coast. From West Coast to East Coast, there are hundreds upon thousands of people who love the sport just as much as us. So the thing is, the the sport has a pulse. Sport martial arts has a huge, huge pulse, and. There are people that want to do it. So there are so many positive things. And I'm going to go to my positive thing here in just a second. But there is so much involvement in people wanting the sport to do good and to give the new kids and the new people, a new generation, something different that we've never had. There are coast to coast, there are people like that. So I think that's the first positive thing. And the other thing is, too, in the United States, and I can't speak for other countries and stuff like that, competition for martial arts has been our focal point since the martial arts became mainstream back in the 50s and 60s competition is what developed our modern day martial arts how many people have went to a bill wallace seminar how many people before he passed away went to a joe Lou seminar um you know martial arts our heroes our people that we do interviews with when you do your interviews with your thing how many of those guys were karate tournament legends yeah the the, the united you. states modern day martial arts martial artists were all built off of competition. You know, Bill Wallace is still doing seminars today off of his competition that he did years, 30, 40 years ago. So our center of the universe is still involved in competition. And I know people with traditional martial arts are like, well, no, competition. But if you look at it as a grand scale, 
competition has been good for the Marsars. The greatest energy surge our school's ever seen. Now, granted, I was young when it came out. I was only six. But the Karate Kid, when the Karate Kid came out, it revolved, the storyline revolved around a, a young man triumphing in a tournament to win and to gain confidence and to do all those things. But it was, what kind of storyline did we have to have? We had to have a comp- competition-based movie to show that. And and I, I know people could argue up and down, but the center of our universe is still going back to competitions. We can be divided. We can do that. But when we come to greet each other and we know about our family and our brothers and sisters in martial arts and we network, it all started with tournaments. One of the major companies in the world that sells uniforms and pads were started out of the back of a van going to cry tournaments. The owner and founder was selling uniforms out of the back of his van and going to cry tournaments. That's how one of our major companies got started in the United States. So it is still the center of our universe, and it still provides so many things for martial artists, whether you're a a pro competitor or a casual competitor. You don't have to be either one, but to go and see martial artists, to go and network with people, to meet new people, to meet new families. And I've seen marriages form out of rival schools this person falls in love with this person they get married and have a family together because they met at a cry tournament there are so many elements that are still good and wholesome for cry tournaments it's still the center of our universe for martial artists Hmm. i agree absolutely yeah i totally agree and and, and, in what's life life is learning to lose because this world is not fair right i mean the the world is not fair everything does not fall right into your pocket you have to work exactly. for things. You have to train hard for things. You you have to, you know, slave to the grind and, and go and work and work and work and work to get up to that, to be number one, to, to get that promotion. And, and competition teaches you to lose, teaches you to try harder. Exactly. Great point. And a great way to bring it out. I want to thank both of you for being here. Mr. Osborne, Master Alexander, appreciate you coming back. This was a great conversation. Listeners, I want to thank you for tuning in and hearing us ramble about something that I hope you can tell all three of us are very passionate about. We really enjoy sport martial arts and really martial arts in general. Uh, I don't have to tell you, you know, Whistle Kick was founded around sparring gear, so there's a reason for that. But I want to thank you for tuning in and hope you'll do so again. Gentlemen, again, thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thank you. Great.